This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Squarespace. Everything you need to create an exceptional website. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com slash macvoices and use the discount code macvoices5. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, we're going to do something a little different or start doing something a little different here. We're going to have a series of interviews on blogging. You might ask why we want to do that. Well, it seems to be one of the most popular forms of web expression right now. One of the easiest to get into, definitely, uh, which presents some challenges of its own in getting noticed. And I wanted to talk to someone who I could think of as an expert in blogging, and I couldn't think of anyone else but Karen Anderson. Uh, of Well, we know her uh, of tidbits, but she does so many things, and she served on the Mac jury. So I'm pleased, very pleased to welcome Karen to the show to talk about blogging. Karen, thanks so much. Chuck, thank you. It's great to be back on again. I look forward to, to exploring this topic with you. Yeah, we talked about this uh, during One Mac Jury, I believe, and we said, you know, we have to get back to this. And so here we are. And w- as we talked about how we're going to do this, we're going to do a series, as, as I said. Um, that'll give the, the viewers and listeners some time to sort of absorb, pay attention to it, get us some questions, comments back, and maybe help us launch into the next the next episode, if you will. But you suggested we start out by talking about the history of blogging. And I think after I finished scratching my head, it's like, why the history of blogging? Does blogging really have a history that's worth examining? Oh, absolutely. And the it's helpful to know the history, whether you're going to be a business blogger, and this is going to have impact on on your business, or whether you're a personal blogger and you want to look at issues around privacy and identity and personal branding. But it all goes way back to the beginning of blogging. Okay. So, and I guess this kind of goes under the heading of you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. So, blogging, you know, and I've remembered very distinctly the first time a friend of mine said something about blogging. It's like, blogging, well, what's the difference between that and having a website? Well, it's interesting because part of it's philosophical difference, and part of it is a really practical difference, which I will get to at some point during our discussion. The philosophical difference is that with, with websites, it's all ways of organizing information on the web. And the web appeared, it became graphic, You, it became free, it cost you almost nothing to put things up there, and people began experimenting. And the first things that people put up were very, very basic websites, almost like mini wikis, where people would take their personal areas of expertise and start posting that information where like-minded people could find it. And in the late 1990s, people started using um, programs like LiveJournal, to share their personal feelings with the rest of the community. And it was called web logging because it literally meant that you were arranging the information in a chronological sense. And at the time, I was sort of mystified by it. And I've learned since then that it comes out of the science fiction fandom community. Many of the early web loggers were people who were in science fiction fandom. And they had back into the 1930s and coming forward the tradition of these ongoing letter streams that would be connected in um, in these fanzines they would send around. And people would write the diary of a trip they had made or meetings they had gone to or adventures they'd been involved in. And really, when you look at those fanzines, you see that you, you, they're, they're, they're weblogs. That's fascinating. When you started down that path, I was ready to say Captain's Log, Stardate, but it obviously predated that quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's people who, who love writing, and these weblogs were ways to express yourself and also, in many ways, to show off how beautifully you could write. You have a lot of people who write very, very beautifully, and not everyone works at a job or has a career in which they get to, to hold forth. And in those days, not many people were published journalists. So this was a way of being a teacher, a writer, a journalist, and a public speaker, and and doing it right there on LiveJournal. The original weblogs tended to be topic-oriented, 
Someone would talk about their experiences with cooking, their travel somewhere, the year that they were going to do something very different with their life. And when I first got into blogging, I think I had just started working at Apple. And I worked all day. And at night, I started to, I was exploring weblogs. And what I did was I, am, I followed people who had completely different lives than mine. And I followed a fellow who was a survivalist and a gun dealer in um, the mountains of Virginia. And then I followed a woman who was an Orthodox Jewish school teacher who was in her late 20s and was considered too old to get married. She was a real feisty character, and she would write about the dates that the matchmakers would set her up on with these very, very Orthodox, very from men, and how she would sabotage and make a complete disaster out of these dates by being sort of an opinionated person. It was very, very wonderful. Okay, that's... Uh, I guess I'm too practical at times because that's always been one of my issues with blogs. I want to look at blogs that will give me something back, and by that I mean I don't want to be a taker all the time, but but to consume something that is useful to me that I can take and, and use. I guess it's akin to reading a novel, uh, although these are not novelizations, they're real people, but they just have lives that are so much different than yours. It was it was very much that way. and. Around, I, I'm going to say about 2003, 2004, some people invented a blogging software called Blogger. And Blogger decoupled blogging from the community. In LiveJournal, it had very much been a community. With Blogger, you forged out on your own and you created a blog, which is what I went and did. That was my first blog. And it made blogging extremely easy. It also led to anonymous blogging. Because what you could do is you created this persona for yourself. No, you know, on the web, no one knows you're a dog. Well, people would develop these fascinating blogs with these personas, and you didn't know if they were real or not real. And it was really sort of a golden age of blogging. Um, that leads into the period where people discovered search engine optimization. Well, Google turns up, and it wants to help you find things on the web and find things in these blogs. And that was when people started gaming the system. In other words, writing blogs that had keywords in them that really had nothing to do with the blog at all. And this is where you start entering the dark ages of blogging, the medieval period, where you would, you would Google something. Like if you had Googled Savannah, Georgia at the beginning, you might have found some great blogs about Savannah, Georgia. And two years later, it's, it's spam for hotels and restaurants in Savannah, Georgia. And that was a really tough time for blogging. The people who'd said, why would you want to blog, pointed to this mess and said, blogs are a disaster. Not a good time. Now, leave it to uh, to us humans to find a way to game the system for our own advantage. That just seems to be the nature of everything from, I guess, websites to blogging to podcasting to just, well, we're talking about SEO and I guess black hat SEO in a way. Well, yeah, and, and also just everything's growing. It's like you join a great club, you like all the people, and then suddenly there are thousands of people in your club. You don't know who anyone is anymore. There are different factions. And, of course, that happened when everyone piled into blogging. The other thing that happened was there was so much out there at that point that you needed ways to handle the information. And at this point, you start getting things like Net News Reader and other news reading systems. And you read a great blog, I want to subscribe to this. And then one day you woke up and you discovered you had 700 blogs in your news reader. <laughs> and, and it just got depressing. You didn't even know where to start. That definitely happened to me. The other thing that happened was a lot of information that I wanted started going away from the blogs and turning up other places. Um, I had been doing a blog um, sort of about my personal life. And a lot of my personal life involves fixing things. I'm obsessed with home repair. And it fascinated me that no matter how beautifully and how heartbreakingly I could write in a blog, my most popular post ever in perpetuity was on how to caulk a bathtub. People genuinely wanted to know how to repair bathtubs and how to do it in such a way that things wouldn't get moldy. And I had a post which I, con I continually upgraded 
every couple of years, and it is without any question the most popular post I ever wrote. People noticed this, and what they started doing was instead of blogs, putting their energy into Wikipedia type sites where you just organized the information by a topic and updated it. The blog wasn't a very efficient way to do that. I'm, I'm trying not to take us too far off the history track here. But there oh, were go ahead. Well, there are a couple things you said in there that, that sort of intrigued me. Uh, the idea that you ended up with too many blogs, that, that to me is akin to walking into a bookstore and, and up to enough, we don't do that enough anymore because they're not around anymore, and having just the overwhelming desire to read you know, 500 books on the shelf, and you just can't do it. That doesn't mean that... Th I'm surprised to hear you characterize it as dark ages, because to me, that that would have been a, a target-rich environment. It's just a matter of trying to figure out which target you want to hit. Well, the problem was, was that the bl bloggers like to get comments back on their blogs. And when I was reading 20 blogs a night, I was following people like the photographer Doug Plummer, as he made his transition from photography to video and from PC to Mac. That was truly wonderful. Um, I followed Andy Yanotko uh, because he's a clever writer and because he told me when the fried clam shack that he and I both liked had burned down, which was an important piece of information for me as someone who had moved from the East Coast. I depended on, on Andy to tell me what was going on in Cambridge. Um, and, and I would leave comments. I wrote did a lot of comments on Doug's blog because he's a good friend of mine. And as there were more and more and more and more and more blogs, I was less likely to check in. I felt like I'd missed a bunch of installments. Uh, and and it, it got overwhelming. And then people like Doug began to realize that the dialogue that had been going on on their blogs wasn't as good as it used to be. And Doug switched. Well, what Doug did is a really... It sort of gets into where we've gotten with blogging more recently. Um, all these people have said to me, I'll never blog. They're all blogging now. They're using Facebook, and Facebook is microblogging. What, what the bloggers are doing now, and which I really love is, I check in on Facebook, and I see a note from Doug, or I check in on Google+, and I see a Google Plus post from uh, David Levine, the, sci the science fiction writer. And David says, I just posted a YouTube video of myself reading my mad scientist story. I would never have gone over to his blog to find this out, but I've now spotted it on Google Plus, And now I go to YouTube. Doug posts a picture every day on his blog, but I'm seeing it through Facebook. Karen, I have a feeling this series is going to turn into about 500 installments because there's so much here to talk about and so much to explore. And I'm going to stop. I'm, I'm not going to take us off off track. So let's okay. keep let's keep going with the history. But each each one, it's almost like every piece here needs to be examined. But but please well, proceed. I'm going to talk a little bit about SEO and business blogging. Um, <coughs> that's where I started taking my personal interest in blogging and making money on it. Not by blogging. I didn't make money by blogging. I made money by helping other people blog, specifically um, companies. And what companies discovered was that a blog was a nice way to bring people to their website and to put a human face on the company. And some companies do this very, very well, and some companies do this very, very badly. Um, I had the extraordinary fortune uh, a couple of years ago to be asked by a company that was a consultant on social media and blogging to go back and write book chapters about their major clients. And I got to see sort of the inside history of some of the big companies and blogging, one of which was Wells Fargo. And if you want to see a corporate entity, a huge corporate entity that does a fine job of blogging, it's Wells Fargo. And another one um, is... PEMCO. Uh, you're not in the Pacific Northwest, but PEMCO is a major insurance company with, with regional roots. And PEMCO had started um, an a ad campaign called Northwest Types. Like, like the guy who wears 
Gore-Tex all the time and wears Birkenstock sandals with furry socks. And they built an entire social media campaign, Facebook, blog, Twitter, everything around these types. Uh, Wells Fargo wanted to start blogging as part of its um, 100-year, I think it's 100-year anniversary um, of its activities in the San Francisco earthquake. And it went and did all this historical research and then let its employees write on the blog about their own relationships with the company and what it meant to have all of the regional and historical background. They just did a good job of it. Um, currently, when you look at what businesses are doing with, with um, blogs, they're doing two things. You find business blogs that are owned by the marketing department, and those are full of keywords. Um, I had the privilege of working with a phenomenal marketing guy for a Seattle area medical devices company, and their company was smaller than the competitors. The competitors were massive. They were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on Google ads. So when you typed in the name of that medical device, which is one that's used by consumers, all the ads that came up were these big companies. This fellow didn't have an advertising budget. He used the blog and he used intelligent, aggressive keywording. And he blogged with frequency. And when you type in the name of that medical device, everything that comes up in the search results is his, is his small company. I mean, he, he beat the big guys may, merely by using good search engine optimization. But is that, is that a good thing? I thought it was. It gave. <laughs> well, he was your it, client. <laughs> yeah, it was. But but he also he he had good stories. He he. I mean, when people his stories, he wasn't using that to lure you into something else. If you were interested in knowing about that device, you got results for his company, and you got to see his device. He did it extremely well. And the other thing he did that a lot of companies don't get. I always am shocked when I go to a company, particularly a high-tech company or, or a trendy startup, and I look at their blog and no one's blogged on it for four or five months. I always say to them, take it down. It's like having a page that, that advertises, we start things and don't finish them. We don't pay attention to our public image. We're clueless. Um, it's so embarrassing. And it's also dumb because from an SEO viewpoint, Google rewards you for frequency. You know, back, back in the dark ages, um, I went, you know, when the web was new and I wanted to say, find furniture in Seattle. And I would type in furniture Seattle and I would get all these furniture stores. And the first four furniture stores had gone out of business. But they were at the top of the ranking. So Google began to reward frequency. And the first furniture stores you got were ones that had a new sale, new web content, or their blog had new content. So I advise a lot of my business clients who are going to do genuine blogging to commit to it and do it twice a week. Because if they don't, they're not getting, they're not going to get any return on it if they're not up there frequently. I don't. I don't want to challenge you on a professional basis. That's not the point of this. Right. But I, I, I hear what you're saying. I guess I still struggle with the idea that you are you're competing for for the SEO ranking instead of just be a pure blogger. And and to my way of thinking, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but a pure blogger in my mind is someone who posts when they have something to say. And you may you may find a photographer or a plumber or you know who knows what you may find everything they say fascinating, but day in and day out it's hard to create just fascinating content. And so I, I sometimes questioned the uh, integrity is not the right word. I'm not. I can't find the right word. But I, I, I question the whole thing as to what the purpose is, and is it just to get good information out there, or is it to manipulate something to try to get eyeballs? Um, it depends. It, it's manipulating something to get eyeballs. But the question is, do you have genuine, valuable content? Um, I did. I did a really fun presentation with Chris Perillo a couple of years ago to the to a Seattle area group of Macintosh service people. 
So these are the people who are out helping companies set up networks, helping people troubleshoot their networks, integrate new software, uh, FileMaker Pro, things that you know the average office is not going to tackle on its own. And these guys got into a room and Chris Perillo and I got up in front of it. And I told them that the problem with, with uh, social media was Chris Perillo. And the problem is, is that <laughs> Chris Perillo does social media from the moment he opens his eyes all night long. But how do you do blogging and social media when you're a business person and you have, if you're lucky, 30 minutes a day to do it? And you want it to be genuine stuff. You want it to be of real value. Um, what I discovered when I when I did the book for Adam and Tonya Angst, the book on the iPhone, I started a companion website to, to publicize my book. I wanted people to go buy my, my book. And I wrote all kinds of philosophical stuff, and I covered the news about the iPhone. And what I discovered got me the most attention and the most comments, because comments are really the way to tell if you're, you're doing anything right, was my best friend's husband. He's an impatient human being, and he loves Max. So he's always getting himself, you know, various things. And then he doesn't read the directions, or he doesn't do a lot of research, or whatever, and I am pelted with questions. Why can't I install this here? Why can't I do that? He got a Verizon iPhone, and he was trying to sync his old Verizon data onto the new phone, and there was something wrong with that system. And I discovered that all I had to do to have great blog posts every day was answer his questions. And his questions weren't very difficult, but you know something? Lots of people had the same question. And the Macintosh service people said to me, but everyone knows that answer. And the answer is no. Macintosh service people know that answer. Your readers don't. Um, another interesting thing I discovered was one day, I, I follow Chris Perillo very closely. And w one day, Chris wrote about the fact that he had that legacy iPhone plan, the one that was all the data you could eat. And, and AT&T had gotten smart. And they wouldn't let you move to the plan that had tethering if you held on to the, all the data you could eat. So you had to make a decision. And I was holding on to all the data I could eat. And Chris said, you know, he said, I went to the AT&T site and I got my records. I looked at how much data I'd been using. I never got close. I never got anywhere close. And I desperately needed tethering. So he said, I, I told AT&T to switch me over. I switched over and life is great. And I realized that Chris's explanation, my friends wouldn't have known where to look on the site. The idea of calling AT&T and asking to have their service changed was terrifying. They would rather have a colonoscopy than talk to AT&T on the phone. <laughs> and, and, it, and, and I thought to myself, all I need to do is translate Chris Perillo into a take control style. Do this. Go to this page. Type in this. Check this thing. If this number is larger than this number, you may want to get tethering. The way to get tethering is call this number at AT&T. Say the following magic words. And I was able to report that when I did this, they flipped the switch and I was switched in 15 minutes. You could literally do that in an airport. You're stuck. You're in an airport. You need tethering. You say, I'm going for it. Call AT&T and it's done. So I discovered that another thing I could do is simply deal with people like Chris Perillo who are talking to the, the insiders and translate what they said into English for the rest of the people. And of course I put some keywords on there and we, we are now actually looking at some comments I want to make about WordPress and, and it, it was great. And I don't consider that's a violation of my ethical code as, as a blogger. No, I, I can't either. You just found a, an excellent source. Just like if, if I were a chef and I were experimenting every day, it might be very interesting for me to post what I did to a chicken today to, you know, or, or what I did to a steak or, you know, what I was experimenting with and let other people leverage that. And, and, and you'd have a little ad for your cookbook right next to yeah. it. <laughs> 
All right. Chuck Joyner barbecues. Yeah, well, <laughs> Chuck does on occasion, but I'm not sure it's noteworthy. On the other hand, well, never mind. Um, let's uh, <laughs> let's just keep going. I, I'm telling you, this I've, I've already got like five topics for future shows. So well, I'll, I'll let you keep rolling here with the history. Well, two things are now happening as we get into the around 2007. And, and people are going to argue with me about my, my numbers. So I'm just moving in chronology. Um, two things happen. One, blogging is no longer the hot thing on the block. In fact, blogging is probably, I mean, you know about mommy blogging? There's now mommy blogging going on. And blogging is sort of in, in, an, in an awkward stage. There's too much of it. Um, and bloggers are doing all these giveaways where they review all these products and they give away things and it, it's sort of a mess. And meanwhile, there's this great social media landscape growing up around blogging. Twitter is out there. Facebook is out there. Um, a number of other, other things we've now forgotten about came and went during this period. Meantime, WordPress has appeared. And I'm a huge fan of WordPress. I'm actually at a point right now where I won't work with clients who aren't using WordPress. Prior to that, people would ask uh, their developer to write blogging software for them. And the developer would write blogging software that had no content management system whatsoever. And I was practically hand coding blog posts. And this was just not working. For, at this point, Google bought Blogger. And I thought totally neglected it. Um, I still have a blog that is on Blogger, and every time I go back, it gets more confusing to deal with. I'm really disappointed with what they did. And then Apple had put some blogging software into Mobile Me that was, how can I say this politely? WordPress discovered that people wanted to customize things. And Apple didn't want to let you customize anything. They were going to design it their way, and, and it it wasn't it wasn't robust. Um, anyway, WordPress made it possible for anybody to look really professional. I love WordPress. I will say only nice things about WordPress. Um, they, and they they enabled blogging to go to a whole other level. So we we have a the other thing that happens at this point is. Journalism stops hating bloggers. This is because people were reading the bloggers, and the, as soon as the bloggers got a hold of Twitter, journalism was in huge trouble. I was sitting at my desk here one afternoon, and the entire neighborhood was rocked by an explosion. I mean, things were falling off of my shelves. President Obama was in town a mile away from where I am sitting, and we've just had an explosion. I seized my iPhone, went to Twitter, and immediately said, there's an explosion in Seattle. And just looking on my Twitter feed, I was able to see that what had happened was somebody had tried to land their plane on the lake while he was here, and it resulted in summoning some supersonic jets out of Portland, which had come over and broken through the sound barrier and shaken the entire community. It was called Obuma. <laughs> oh, ouch, ouch, ouch. There, there, there was a Twitter offshoot that would let you just see who was Twittering within like a half a mile of your house. And I would hear, like, we have, we have mudslides on the train tracks all the time. And I got to actually make several friends in the neighborhood by who else was up at three in the morning when the mudslide hit the train. And you would get to know people. Hey, you look familiar. Do you know my friend so-and-so? Um, Twitter began running the news. And once, once Twitter started running the news, the journalists all got on Twitter. And then the journalists decided, you know, I might as well just blog while I'm out here since my paper's not going to publish anything for several hours. And then the papers started harnessing the bloggers. And there was this big thing of they aren't paying the bloggers, but the bloggers are blogging. Are they controlling the bloggers? And the journalists just turned into the bloggers and all sort of got integrated. And now journalism essentially uh, is blogging. And I have to wonder at some level, with the exception of credentials and all that, wasn't 
journal, a lot of journalism always blogging, just in a different medium. <laughs> I'm a journalist. <laughs> I have a master's degree. Um, so now I'm in trouble. I just insulted you. <laughs> no. no um, oh, allow me to... Journalism, to journalism destroyed itself. Journalism destroyed itself in the 80s and 90s. It, 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 people looked for ways to save money. They stopped doing in-depth. All those things that journalism does better than blogging, journalism stopped doing. It stopped doing investigative reporting. Um, I worked in newsrooms where the investigative reporters were those weird guys in motorcycle boots over there. Yeah, we'll give them something to do as long as the person they catch isn't the publisher's golfing buddy. So the, the newspapers had, and, the, and they weren't spending any money on anything. It was pathetic. They were running more and more celebrity gossip. I mean, local papers need to take up space with Hollywood gossip. I don't think so. So the, I was very unsympathetic with the journalists screaming about bloggers who did not have any, any ethics training, which they didn't, going out there and, and getting in the way of journalists. The journalists... The journalists have been betrayed by their own newspapers. And yes, it is upsetting as a journalist for me to see bloggers not understand actually when they're being taken in by a source. A lot of uh, my biggest complaint about bloggers is they get manipulated easily. And now a message from Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. You need a website, but you don't know who to trust or where to turn. You don't know how long it will take or how hard it will be. You don't know what it will look like or what should be on it. Have I got a solution for you? Step one, go to squarespace.com slash macvoices to sign up for a 14-day free trial. Step two, start your site by picking from the amazing array of templates available. Don't worry, you can always change your mind later. Step three, tweak the look of your pages with Layout Engine so they look exactly the way you want them to. Step four, add a photo gallery. After all, your world isn't just made up of text. Step five, add a blog to your site so you have a place to capture and share all that brilliance you've been letting slip away. Step six, give your site some additional personalization with the style editor. Pick your colors, fonts, and layouts from presets or create your own. Step seven, Hook up your social network site so people know where else to find you. Step eight, sit back, admire, and play with your site for 14 days for free. Have any questions or issues? Squarespace has 24 seven customer support. They're sitting there just waiting for you to call, but you won't need to because Squarespace makes things so easy. Step nine, 14 days later, after receiving all sorts of compliments on your new site and how you must be some kind of genius programmer, Go back to squarespace.com slash macvoices and use the offer code macvoices5 to sign up and save 10%. Oh, and don't forget that if you sign up for a year, you even get a free custom domain name. Again, that's squarespace.com slash macvoices and the offer code macvoices5 to get 10% off your first purchase. Simple, eh? There are more steps to making breakfast. Squarespace. Everything you need to create an exceptional website. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. But to go back to why journalism imploded, it wasn't that the fault of the the, the public, the the people that were reading, because they would rather read Hollywood gossip than an investigative report. And you know, at the end of the day, you got to make a turn a profit to keep paying people and keep the doors open. So are we kind of at fault? I mean, I, I think of that right now in the in the popular media. And yeah. anybody who's been on this sh or has listened to the show knows, you know, what my opinions of what we see on network TV. And, and I think it's it's taken to the next level. Well, I think that, that there, I mean, you could easily say, that art museums would collapse because the average person doesn't want to go to the art museum. But there are institutions that, that underwrite journalism. There always have been. And those institutions um, kind of fell apart. 
I think during I think during the eighties, there was so much emphasis put on quarterly returns, as opposed to where you were going to be in a five year plan or a ten year plan. It, the same the same thing that happened to the auto industry happened to journalism, and it wasn't because we didn't want to have good cars anymore. The public went out and bought Toyotas, and when that was going on, and and I think journalism is going to find its way back. I think. Journal, the core of journalism still exists, and I think it's going to. Res- I think there are going to be good news sites. It's not all going to be the Huffington Post. Ooh, um, <laughs> you're not, not going to get sucked into that. Yes. So, so let's talk about the blogging as it is today. Um, and and I've, I've, I'm going to tread on some dangerous ground here because I'm going to mention a, a sponsor of the show, Squarespace. All right, and, I, and I'm going to use Squarespace as an example. So I want it out there very clearly that I'm using, okay. I'm trying to be pure here and talk about Squarespace and think about um, Tumblr and think, well, Poster is, is now gone. Blogger is still around. There are a lot of services of one kind or another that have made it very easy to create a web presence. I personally kind of see that as a good thing because I think it's we we've talked so much about the democratization of media and it's becoming even more democratized and and my sites right now are run on WordPress and I have a love hate relationship with WordPress because it is powerful it is sophisticated it is customizable but right now a lot of people I know and some very high profile people are fighting some of the in, in, injection infections yes you know and if if you have not retained someone like you then I'm sitting here sitting somewhere with a WordPress blog and yeah and I should have mentioned wordpress.org as well sorry um, yes you know um, but but they're sitting there with an infected blog who now Google has blackballed and they don't have a clue as to what to do or who to call. Yes. And so this presents a problem to me with the current state of blogging, and it's it's a reason why WordPress.org, Squarespace, Tumblr, even Blogger, to me, represent very attractive opportunities for people. Yeah, that's that that's a problem. Google and WordPress do not seem to be equipped to deal with the situation. And yet, there's nothing that, that you can do about it. There's no way that you can protect yourself. Um, I always, and, and, and I am not the person to call around a security issue, but I know who to call about it. Um, one of the ways that I recommend that people protect themselves from that sort of identity sabotage is to have a lot of different identities. Perhaps to have a website that is hosted one way, I know a lot of people who have their website hosted with a traditional host, and then they have their blog hosted by WordPress that is then getting a redirect. And there's a lot that you can do with that. Um, Also, I'm always horrified. I've had a number of friends who had their WordPress sites hijacked. And one of the fascinating hijackings that's going on now that I urge everyone to check for is the hijackers only hijack the mobile version of your site. And I, I'm the first person ever, I think, to have blogged about this. Um, I was very proud of my discovery. I worked with a group, and I was looking at something on our website, and I discovered that our website went to a site that told you to download Adobe Reader, and it was in Romanian. And I thought, this is so not right. And I called our sysop, who was employed by a very famous company, uh, that you would know the name of, and I won't say it. I called him at work and said, our site's been hijacked. And he, you hear a clackety, clackety, clack. No, it looks fine. (laughs) Our site's been hijacked. Yeah, he says, you're nuts. And I said, pick up your cell phone. At which point I heard words that I cannot repeat on your show. (laughs) And, And of course, well, I then did a little research and I discovered that some of these people who are trying to lure people into a site in Eastern Europe and get them to download an infected file, they've discovered that they can go to a site and just hijack its mobile version, and the sysops will never notice because sysops are not known for checking the site using their BlackBerry, their Android, or their iPhone. So I urge people to watch out for that. I also had a period a couple weeks ago where 
two of my clients in one week had their sites hijacked through the far more traditional thing of um, they had given when they got their site hosted and they registered their site, they'd given as the email contact an email that went back to that site. So it had been very, very easy for hijackers to get at it. And I always, and again, some very, very high level people had had this happen to them. And I now urge people to always make sure that when they register their site, the contact information is for a an email hosted completely somewhere else. So diversification is an excellent protection. There is, unfortunately, no protection. The viruses, there'll be different viruses next week from the ones there are this week. Um, the best protection is diversification. And as far as calling Google and um, WordPress, um, getting them to respond, I don't know about WordPress. There are uh, websites like SEO Moz. Um, are you familiar with Rand Fishkin's SEO Moz? No. He is sort of He's sort of the, the crown prince of white hat search engine optimization. And he has a very large company. And one of the things they do is they watch Google very closely and how those algorithms change and how Google is treating people. And if Google is blacklisting people for things that are not their fault, Rand and SEO Moz are usually the first people on the forefront. And they apparently um, have a way of communicating to Google about this. I would describe them as, as the SEO person's trade association. And they're out there to make sure that people get treated fairly by Google and by other search engines. You know, I feel a need to, in this particular topic to make sure that I'm, I don't, I don't want anyone to think I'm demonizing Google. If, if a site is infected and, and Google says it's infected, I, you know, in in one way, in my mind, they're doing their job. Um, if they if the site becomes uninfected and then they don't remove it just as fast, then they're not doing their job. But at the end of the day, you know, it's tough, and maybe they've assigned themselves the internet police, and if that's their role, then they have to take it seriously. But it it is a slippery slope. There's no question. Well, it, yeah, dealing with Google is sort of like dealing with the IRS. That w once you're in trouble. You kind of stay in trouble, and <laughs> no, it, it's true. Yeah, and, and 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 people really do. It would be useful, and it actually surprises me that with the vast amount of manpower that Google and probably WordPress also have, and Facebook is actually someone else going to this. They have all these unhappy people who are bombarding them and trying to get things done and freaking out, and it would seem as though it would t be a matter of a 48 hours of a couple of intelligent people developing a procedural complaint form where you could file a case complaint. They would check you out and get back to you. But companies aren't good with this. I mean, I, I think of, of my friends who were trying to get apps, um, get apps approved at Apple who talk about you get into this loop and if your app has a problem, you, it can take a very long time to get out of that loop. Yeah. Karen, let's let's wrap the first session here with something you referenced earlier, and I was I was really glad because I wanted to get there, and that is the the microblogging plat platforms or the social blogging platforms or the social media platforms, and depending on who you talk to, it, that that can those words can be used to describe Twitter, Facebook, App.net. Um, Maybe to a little lesser degree, LinkedIn, um, and I'm sure that you know. Then they're all kind of specialized social networks. Is that blogging? Is that not blogging? Is it micro blogging? Uh, you, are you satisfied with that term? Um, I think it must be blogging. Um, you know, like, like is it dog food? Does the dog eat it? Because the dog eats it. Um, I'm the dog, <laughs> and I eat it, and I find myself. Um, things that I used to blog and that I should blog, I don't have time. And I'm just rushing over and, and putting something out on Twitter like, hey guys, if you want to solve this problem, go see what Jeff Carlson said about it. Or if you want to see a really creative use of this particular thing, please go see what Jeff Porton is doing. Um, yeah, 
and, and I'm angry at myself, and I should be putting some of these things on my blog. I ran a conference a few weeks ago. It's the first time I've ever run a for-profit conference. I've run a lot of nonprofit ones, and I ran it with more vigilance because I had a client there who had to pay my bill. And I learned a tremendous amount. And I want to um, write a blog post about doing what are called boutique conferences. And I haven't gotten around to it. And I'm so frustrated because I can feel the ideas slipping away. And what I'll probably end up doing is just going to Twitter and saying, if you're running a conference in Minneapolis, the Hyatt Regency are the nicest people on the planet. You'll want to work with them. Because... I can get that out, and that's a value to my followers. But you know, it, it, the, the social media environment has become an integral part of blogging because it used to be you'd, you'd write a blog post, and it was like dropping a stone from a very high place, and you couldn't hear it splash. But now, when I write a blog post, I have WordPress publicize function, and the publicize function lets me send it to Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And then I can use WordPress stats to see which one of those drove, which drove them at most click-throughs to my blog, which I found to be extremely interesting. So it's it's interesting to hear you as as an expert in this stuff talk that way. I, I think a lot of us have struggled with all right, what is appropriate for my sites, my blog, whatever my longer form web presence is. I, I trying to find the right phrase here versus what I put on social media and do I put it on social media and link back and you know and sometimes you do that and people say gee thanks great information and other people say oh you know you're spamming us with trying to get us to your blog it really is kind of in the eye of the beholder and if you're going to put yourself out there you have to develop a bit of a thick skin um I actually have discovered that um my audiences are so diverse. I'm someone who is really, really, really careful about letting my clients near me on Facebook. I know people like Scott Abel, um, who's a, a real guru a large content management systems, and everybody is Scott's friend. And I actually, I, I really, I think he's amazing. And I know all about his personal life, even though I've never directly met him. We've exchanged some very valuable information, and he's right there in Facebook. But I only have one client I let near me in Facebook. I keep all my clients over on LinkedIn. So if I'm, if I'm publicizing something, the people on LinkedIn are my serious colleagues. The people on Facebook are my buds. And I'm finding that Twitter is... It's going through that newsreader phase of there's just so much, there's just so much stuff happening that the people who are seeing me on Twitter, it's like they're there in a minute. And my, my LinkedIn friends are not watching Twitter. Twitter is very fortuitous. Twitter is where I'm going to gather new people who have never met me before. And they're seeing me because they follow Chris Perillo, they follow Kathy Gill one of the experts on journalism blogging, and they say, well, gee, this friend of Kathy's just said this. I might as well go look. So, and, and, and Twitter is very fortuitous. A very cool thing came up on Twitter uh, two or three months ago that just restored my faith in social media. It was called hashtag Seattle Noir. And people were writing these little tweets that were like, a noir detective novel sentence, and they were all about Seattle. And someone had written, um, they're so insider, I don't know if actually someone who's not from Seattle had gotten them, would get them, but one of them was something about something, um, bodies are disappearing, things are happening, this one goes right to the top. It, it said, you, you mean the police chief? No, the Cascade Bicycle Club. Because in in Seattle we're so bicycle obsessed, the Cascade Bicycle Club is 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 a mover and shaker. <laughs> but this noir thing caught on, and people began alerting other people and professional writers, I mean novelists, well known people were doing this, and this Seattle noir hashtag got going, and then other cities started doing it. And it was so creative, it was so wonderful, that it made me realize why we started doing the social media stuff in the first place. 
Karen, I think we have a lot of interesting topics ahead of us, and and maybe even a couple debates, because uh, there are things that that I I really want to get into, and and I have an idea from these conversations that you're not going to agree with me. So this will be fun. This will be fun. I I'd like to talk at some point with some people who blogged and quit, who just blogging. Got, they got burnt out. I think that would really be interesting. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't know what to expect when we started this, but I've, I've already got a bunch of ideas. So, folks, get used to seeing Karen because she'll be back. I, I think on a regular basis if she's willing to talk about this, and we may invite a few friends along as well. Um, and I want to make sure that we say that. We would like to hear from you about what you would like to hear about blogging. Your questions, comments, threats, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> we may get those. <laughs> yeah, whatever you want to send to us, uh, because we'd like to not just have this be Karen, Karen's and my discussions. We'd like to have them be your discussions, too. So uh, chuck at macvoices.com or use the contact form on my website. Send them in. I'll get them to Karen, and we'll integrate them into our schedule. Karen, thank you so much for the time. This is really interesting. We'll look forward to seeing you and your cat next time. Thank you so much, Chuck. <laughs> oh, I, I'm sorry. Before you before we go, we should let you uh, promote your blog and tell folks where they can find out more about you. I'll have it in the show notes, but still, please. My blog, in dire need of being updated with the story of the conference in Minneapolis, is writerway.com. Great. Folks, MacVoices.com is where you can find most of what I do and links to everything that's not there. Until the next time, this is the Talk in the Mac community. Thanks for watching. Visit MacVoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, App.net, Google+, Facebook, and for more Apple, Mac, and tech-related shows, including Mac Voices, Mac Notables, the Mac Jury, and the Mac Voices Briefing. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at BackbeatMedia.com.